Sir, let me begin by asking you, and before that, um, a very happy birthday. It's your birthday today. Tuam Jeeve Masharada Shatam. May you live to be 100 years and a very happy and healthy 100 years, sir. Are we, are we a Hindu civilizational state and are we reclaiming it? To my mind, and I've uh, written my last book, is a book called The Great Hindu Civilization. So I have no doubt in my mind that we are a civilization and the mistake critics make is to try and conflate and understand civilization with a nation state. As you all know, a nation state in the modern sense as we know it was born only in the 17th century with the Treaty of Westphalia. Before that, people existed without the consciousness in a modern sense of a nation, but they had a civilizational overlap that was verifiable. And as far as Hindu civilization goes, it goes back even to the period before the dawn of time. As you know, our history has been predated now by at least two millennium. Uh, with, with greater research, science, and every other tool at our command, we now know that the earlier theory that the Aryans came in sometime around 1500 BCE overwhelmed the Indus Valley civilization here, which is now treated as rubbish by all historians. Today that theory, which was a British creation, has been completely set aside and the antiquity of this civilization has been pushed back as a result of the research done largely on that elusive river called Saraswati. So we now go back to about at least 4000 BCE or not, if not more. So, so the so oldest surviving civilization and we have survived. And we have survived. Every other civilization of that period has perished. And that is, of course, a tribute to the conquering eclecticism of this civilization. Of the Hindu civilization. So, is it time, Harsh, to claim it, to reclaim it? We are a secular country, but a Hindu civilization, and to own it. So, <clears throat> absolutely. Thank you so much, Gora, for having me. Thank you, Nirude. Happy birthday, sir. <laughs> it's an you. honor to share the stage with you. Uh, Absolutely. So we have to look at it in a larger perspective. As Sir was saying, the modern nation state was, you know, basically birthed with the Treaty of Westphalia. So before that, all quote unquote pagan cultures, non Abrahamic cultures, did not have a sense of the theological other. It is the, it is the contribution of the Abrahamic uh, worldview organization which led into conquering, converting people then further led to internal schisms. For example, Germany became Protestant, Iran became Shia. And in Europe that led to, after these intra-Christian civil wars, led to the modern nation state. It is in this context uh, that we have to see the Indian nation state, where of course partition happened, and Muslim majority areas separated in 1947. Even in 1971, when the so-called two nation theory was drowned in the Bay of Bengal, it actually was not because nobody from Bangladesh wanted to join India and nobody from West Bengal wanted Bangladesh to join, despite all uh, claims of great common Bengali cultural identity. So it is de facto a reality that the Indian nation state is very much a legacy of the Hindu dharmic civilization. Uh, now it is a Hindu Rashtra. Whether it is a Hindu Rajya or not depends on how you define the semantics of it. Okay. Ambassador, do you see it as a secular country, but a Hindu Rashtra? No, I am a little wary of the label Hindu Rashtra because it is exclusionist by definition, which Hinduism itself has not been. Let me go back because this question is important. Why is it that scholars of Hindu civilization like Amartya Sen or scholars of history like Ramina Thapa try to either avoid or debunk 
or even hostilely critique the notion of a Hindu civilization. Or Why? denigrate in some instances? I don't think denigrate. I will not use the word because Amartya Sen is a scholar of Sanskrit. I once asked him, why have you not given up your Indian passport? You believe in multiple identities, you live abroad. Why, why the Indian passport? And he whispered to me over his glass of wine and said, you know, Pavan, I can't give it up. I learned Sanskrit. So the point I'm making is that there is a principal identity and they are aware of it. But why are they critical is because they do not want in today's milieu for political and perhaps valid reasons to accept the greatness of a civilization and its multifaceted achievements, not without blemishes, but nevertheless refinements which are beyond imagination. Because they look at it as glorification of a Hindu past, which means by de definition exclusion of a modern secular republic and the other faiths who live in our country. No, but is now, that actually true? I mean, if you glorify your Hindu past, are you excluding the others? So I respectfully disagree with uh, Pavanji here. I think obviously, you know, if you are proud of the Hindu civilization, it is the Hindu Rashtra. Uh, Hindu Rashtra is not exclusive in any way whatsoever because what is Hinduism? We need to first define these terms. Hinduism to me is a subset of dharma. Dharma is universalist. It is the subset of dharma which overlaps with Bharatiya Sanskriti. It is simply the local idiomatic expression of universalist dharma. Uh, in India, we never have a minority problem with the Parsis. We never have a minority problem with the Jains. We never have a minority problems uh, with the Jews. Uh, for example, they do not proselytize even though they are Abrahamic. So we actually have a minority problem where there is aggressive uh, tendencies to convert or to be diffident about accepting nationality wholesale. You know, Muhammad Iqbal famously said, in taza khudaon mein sabse bada vatan hai, jo pehran iska hai, wo mazhab ka kafan hai. So the point there is, they refuse to accept the nation state in an ideological sense because that goes against the unity of ummah. And you have Christian, Christian analogies of that as well, although Christianity has evolved a lot, a lot in the last couple of centuries. So there is a fundamental problem, there is a fundamental tension at the acceptance of the Indian nation state by the two universalizing, homogenizing Abrahamic religions. And we have to talk about it openly because otherwise there is no sense of this conversation. Okay. Ambassador, if, if the Hindu religion or the Hindu way of life talks about Vasudeva Kutumbakam, how is it excluding anyone, sir? First of all, when you say Hindu Rashtra, if your meaning is in a civilizational sense that in this consecrated land there has been a verifiable civilization for millennia and which has identifiable traits, I can accept it. My problem is when we take a label of this nature and as Harsh was saying, try to see it as a point of conflict between Hinduism and that of the other faiths. He mentioned the Parsis. Naturally, numerically, they are a very small minority. Now you have 200 million Muslims in this country. I think we need to take the path whereby we recognize a great past and a great civilization which was glossed over in the decades after 47. And there are reasons for it. We need to go beyond that, but not go so far as to say that now, as a monolith, this nation is only Hindu. Because that goes against the tenets of Hindu. You began your introduction by saying, Ekam Sat Vipraha Bauda Vadanti. The truth is one, wise people call it by different names. You said, there are others, Ano Bhadra, Kritavantyu, Vishita. Let good thoughts flow to me from all directions. Hinduism, in fact, that's the reason why Wendy Doniger says, mistakenly, that it's a cross between a tortoise and an armageddeligo. She actually says this. Yeah. And the conceit, the misguided conceit and the unforgivable ignorance of the British who feel they created India is another contributing factor. 
people don't understand or abrahamic faiths find it difficult to understand the natural diversity within hinduism within a framework of rock solid unity that is called by professor rajiv malhotra chaos anxiety we don't have a bible we don't have one church we don't have one god we don't have one prescribed ritual we have six systems of hindu philosophy and each of them can technically be called atheist they are not talking of god they are talking about what could be the ultimate truth behind the bewildering plurality of this cosmos so therefore hinduism has always proceeded as a mighty stream with tributaries joining and getting absorbed into it and with the mighty stream benefiting from But those tributaries you know that's a very interesting I, point that you brought out okay you yeah, i just want to say thank you sir for making the case better than i could have that a hindu rashtra cannot possibly be monolithic if these are the key tenets of hinduism i cannot possibly see a scenario in which it would be monolithic under no rss bjp vision are we asked to worship only one god are we asked to follow only one sampradaya follow only one pant listen to only one guru follow only one of those six astik or nastik schools so i am trying to understand what is the straw man that we are attacking here which does not exist in the very first place I, I, i'll tell it you it is a valid question would you uh, agree may may I, may I answer It's kindly this. you see when hindu rashtra is in the hands of harsh i am a little more assured but the, today the uh, right man in the wrong party kind of thing it, it never gets old but it's not true <laughs> let me let me just i will finish. be the wrong man 20 years from now <laughs> uh, let me just finish but today because of the politicization of the reclaiming of legitimate reclaiming of a great civilization i think very often the notion itself is passed into those if you lock up in a room as they seek to violently protect hinduism if you lock them in a room and ask them to write a one page essay on hinduism i guarantee you they'll fail but in other words in other words in other words I, what i'm saying is that when it is used in a political sense then instead of following the precepts of hinduism which is not a monolith you are actually creating points of friction in a modern secular republic where the minorities cannot be wished away now that does no, not diminish who wants to wish away the minorities is see, my point see, Hindu, does anybody want to wish away minorities I, I, as i was saying it's a straw man this right question see hinduism per se is political when i am doing a mahamrityunjay mantra 108 times i am worshiping shiva the word hindu has no meaning or connotation at that point of time the very existence of the word hindu is per se political we must understand it which is why the differentiation between hinduism and hindutva is a false binary the i am being made conscious of my non abrahamic status in a largely abrahamic world the word obviously came first in the 13th century uh, to differentiate from the turshukas the turkic muslim invaders the word ism was added in the early 19th century apparently by raja ram mohan roy became hinduism the word hindu by definition makes me understand that gorav and pavan and harsh all belong to this large capacious umbrella common wealth of religions even though we might worship completely different gods so if the word hinduism has to be political sir the word hinduism cannot possibly have theological and spiritual connotations because no hindu text no shruti or even earlier smritis mentions the word it has to be political it must be seen in a constructive sense you see when you say political very often people say that there was no such word as hindu but megasthenes when he came to the court of chandragupt maurya in the 4th century bce clearly refers to hindus in other words a people conscious of their civilizational status may not have a word to describe themselves but they are aware of the concept and very often that word is given by outsiders be it the persians be it the chinese be it the arabs so therefore hindus were not conceived in my sense of the term and harsh is a knowledgeable man as a political entity they were conceived as a cultural entity where a great religion 
which could say aham brahmasmi tat tvam asi i am atma brahm a religion of this nature also built in parallel a great civilization with refinements in the field of music of dance of architecture of science of a world view and yet in today's day and age you know when you when you talk about this from 4th century bc and predating that too you said in today's day and age most of most people in our country won't be able to write one page why is it that we are such a great civilization and our people know nothing our own people know nothing of it is it because of these turkic invasions as you call it uh, you know from 10th century ad to 200 years of british rule and even post 1947 we are made to feel ashamed of our own dharm of our own culture and whatever the brits teach us is the best so therefore if i may just answer no you see you have to recognize the past this attempt to gloss over the extent of sheer destruction of the artifacts and centers of learning of hindu civilization with the coming of the turkic invasion invasions was glossed over i say glossed over or undervalued in the aftermath of 1947 and the partition for well intentions reason but it has created a backlash because almost our historical textbooks made out that the invaders came in a tourist bus they offered us some biryani we gave them some puri alu and a ganga jamuna tehzeeb built up it didn't happen like that there was massive destruction will do on right that it is one of the most bloody chapters in world history bloodiest, bloodiest bloody. chapter in world history so there was destruction the greatness of hindu civilization and hinduism is that unlike many other countries like for instance indonesia yeah in hinduism survived by escaping from the crevices of the cage it went to the masses through the bhakti movement yeah. and became a powerful movement not needing necessarily a leadership in the old sense but among the people it survived so, because of the political awareness of this civilization and culture being separate in many ways orthogonal to the abrahamic proselytizing culture like shivaji talked about hindavi swarajya explicitly opposing the turkshuka raj wanting to reclaim ayodhya kashi mathura so there was whether we call it cultural or political is a difference without a distinction it was very much a political awareness of this dharmic civilization being under attack maybe for multiple motives or one of the motives being religious motives so i agree again with you what you are saying sir but then therefore to say it is not political is as i said is just accepting it but without saying so no no and sir when when chhatrapati shivaji maharaj was also trying to reclaim ayodhya mathura kashi if that effort is made today why should it be seen as wrong why should there be in your view perhaps a truth and reconciliation commission find out what went wrong and how to set it right i'll just answer that question but first what you asked what the british did the great success of british rule was not the physical subjugation of india it was the colonization of our mind and that political freedom can come in 1947 the cultural colonization takes decades to go and we have not made a serious effort to interrogate it and a serious effort without xenophobia and chauvinism to again resuscitate the greatness of many aspects of our past so that's a weakness and which no government has done so far appropriately okay. now to your question of course of course kashi apart from ayodhya as as per available historical evidence aurangzeb built the mosque at the very spot of the vishwanath temple and it is one of the 12 jyotirlings jyotirlings in fact later ahilya bai of indore had that sanctum sanctorum shifted in order to establish the mosque and perhaps much of the same happened in mathura the point is this ayodhya we have a supreme court judgment how long can you 
rectify the historical so assaults as, of as the past. As long as it takes. No, assaults of the past by creating endemic instability today because ultimately the past can be recognized can be resolved through the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Okay. But as Mohan Bhagwat ji asked, if the entire country goes about looking for a no. mosque under every temple, Shivling what under. is going to happen to India? Okay. No, I, I, no, I, I, harsh. I, no, I just want to yeah. answer some points that are said. Okay. Mohan Bhagwat ji was right to say, it, please don't look for a shivling under every mosque. But that does not mean that the known, accepted mandirs which were destroyed deliberately based on religious hatred and mosques were built on top of that, should not be reclaimed. There is, there is no statute of limitations on that in a civilizational sense. We have every right, indeed responsibility, to reclaim every single one of them. And my point is, uh, on what basis will that create tensions? It can only create tensions if there is a supremacist residue still remaining. If you know that this was wrongly destroyed, and then my place of worship was built on that, it is only natural and generous in a human spirit, in a humane spirit to offer it. Should it not? Should that not be the default expectation? Are we not indulging in the soft bigotry of low expectations by saying some people will get violent if you just ask for what is fair and reasonable? Now, once that is offered, let me humbly submit, it is Hindu civilization's generosity that they will draw the line earlier than what people say. But to beforehand say that you can only go so far and no further, that this Places of Worship Act, which is, cannot be part of the basic structure doctrine, this is the final line, that cannot be in principle accepted. Now, Hindu culture, Hindu civilization may say, okay, this is enough, because we notice that there is no residual of supremacism left. But it, that cannot be imposed on us in saying that if you do not agree, you are ipso facto barbarian or bigoted. That has to be our decision, not the decision of the party who actually did those offenses. So that principle needs to be established. Okay, so this, my only counter to this is, if you begin to rectify what needs to be rectified of what was done wrong in the past, it's very difficult to stop this uncontrolled train. No, but that's where now, the truth uh, and reconciliation that, occurs. That's Now, that, that could be an answer. So, if everyone begins to seek legitimis, legitimization today or rectification today of what was done wrong in the past, then it is not only the rectification which is very difficult to achieve in a full sense, but the collateral consequences of that, I mean, India today had done a survey during the Babri Masjid at that time. And if I'm not mistaken, a majority of the respondents said, ki bhai, mandir bane ya mosque bane, mandir ban jaye to achcha hai, hame to hospital, school, naukri, dhanda, you know the traders... Ab to hamara no, bharat no, no, isse aage padh na. I'm just saying. Aspital bhi banayenge, school bhi banayenge, Haan, mandir bhi banayenge. But, 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 it's not always that these kind of situations can prove, uh, go ahead in a parallel basis in perpetuity. There are, there, are, that. there are priorities okay. and there are reasons to accept. In a modern nation, the tolerance that needs to be given, not to minuscule minorities which you can overrun, by minorities that have become a part of your country's fabric and exist in numbers where they cannot be either erased or thrown into I, the I Arabian must, I must sea. respond to that, sir. So therefore I am saying, I, I make a plea for sanity. I believe that much more needs to be done to recognize the validity of this civilization of the past. It needs to become part of educational curriculums if it is not tinged with xenophobia. Okay. I, just want yeah. to quick, I just want to quickly say that, you know, we do uh, truth and reconciliation on the axis of caste. We have affirmative action for sins and victimhood that was created pre-1947, there is no way that religion is a different axis. So if we can do it on caste, we can do it on religion as well. It is, all depends on the generosity of the two parties involved. The generosity of, of our... I will just end. Kuch, yes. The reason why India survives today as a nation, with, as a multicultural, plural nation, is what was said as a verity. Kuch baat hai. कि हस्ती मिटती नहीं हमारी बरसों रहा है दुश्मन
दौरे जहां हमारा कुंड हैव कंक्लूडेड इट बेटर थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर ज्वाइनिंग अस फॉर दिस एक्सट्रीमली एक्सट्रीमली इंटरेस्टिंग सेशन सर थैंक यू वेरी मच Stay on stage with us just a moment as we uh, present a token of our appreciation uh, to our guests. Could I invite Raj Changappa to come up on stage, uh, please?